It is a great pleasure for me to open the 2018 edition of the OECD Green Growth and Sustainable Development Forum. Six years ago, this forum was established, and the forum's mandate is to identify the knowledge gaps in cross-cutting green growth issues and development recommendations for further work by the OECD and other organizations. But economic growth is only one part of the picture. To be successful, <coughs> successful, the green transition must be an inclusive transition, addressing inequality, falling living standards, and the fate of left behind communities is at the top of political agenda in many countries. It is also at the heart of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals. OECD's analysis shows that inequality has grown in recent decades with the top 10% of income earners making nine times more than the poorest 10% across the OECD, off from seven times 25 years ago. Financial wealth of households in the top quintile is around 72 times larger than the wealth held by the lowest distribution bracket. Aware of the importance of knowledge and information, GGGI is also dedicated to improving multi-directional knowledge sharing and promoting poverty reduction, social inclusion, environmental sustainability, and economic growth. That is why GGGI, together with its founding partners, invested in the Green Growth Knowledge Platform. These are especially exciting times for the GGKP. The GGKP, already the world's largest dedicated repository of green growth resources, case studies, and national documents, offers unequaled access to green growth initiatives for the global policy community. Now, as it opens up as a knowledge platform to the industry and finance communities, this provides a unique opportunity to work together with the policy community. I look forward to seeing the collective impact we can make together when these communities from all over the world come together to share their knowledge and expertise on green growth. Transformative on the ground change requires collective action among a diverse set of stakeholders. Too often, even large green economy efforts have been siloed into a single community. We envision a network where actors from all communities will be able to have rapid access to consolidated and organized knowledge and data tailored to their needs. Let me uh, talk about the just uh, transition, which again is a very important part of well-founded policy. And here, there's actually lots we can learn from past experience of doing it badly. Uh, essentially, we've had a move to services that's a long-term change in economic growth. We've known that for a very long time. Uh, we've had lots of labor-saving technical progress. We've had globalization and the shift of the international division of labor. And those are three trends which are not going to go away. And then whack, we hit people with a global financial crisis. And then we ask them, are you happy? Well, what do we hear? Well, we, we hear Brexit and uh, that kind of thing. So we have managed, as it were, dislocation in rich economies, we've managed it badly. You know, we've seen in the UK the decline of shipbuilding, we didn't manage that very well. The coal mining, we didn't manage that very well. Those were things that were gonna happen as the world changes. But we have to look ahead and do it much better than before. So we should think of this transition to low carbon economy as commingled with those other big transitions that are taking place, move to services, the um, uh, labor-saving technical progress, robotics, artificial intelligence, globalization, and we hope that we don't hit people too soon with another financial crisis. But we have to put all those things together and manage the just transition. So what do we do? Well, we train people initially for change. There's going to be a lot of change in their lives. 
So lifelong learning. When the change hits particularly hard, we have to come in to support new skills, training, entrepreneurship, small and medium-sized enterprises, and so on. Collaboration between local governments, universities, and business can be very powerful in that uh, process. Actually, a lot of the, in the north of England, a lot of the places that got well off under the old system did spend some of their money not only on town halls, but also on universities. So actually in those places, quite a lot of good universities that can collaborate well. You can relocate public sector activities in the UK. We moved to Newcastle, which was important for coal and shipbuilding. Those had declined. We moved Social Security Administration to Newcastle. One of the better things that the UK has done in this uh, context. And of course, uh, when those opportunities are not created, or for some people they won't work, then strong social protection is necessary too. So we can see actually the policies that, and I'm sure that our, our trade union colleague on the, uh, who'll be after me will comment directly on that. We've worked very closely with Sharon Burroughs, the head of the International Trade Union Group. Uh, this is the time now where we really have to up our focus. And there's so much that we can do that makes this story of the transition uh, still more inclusive if we get it right. So there is a, a very attractive story there. We have to tell that story, but we have to tell it persuasively, and our persuasiveness has to be so strong that we promote action on the scale and urgency that we, we require. I think that we have done a strong work with the international trade union movement in order to convince our workers that the change is not only an emergency, it's necessary, it's vital for health reasons. We have seen the, the, the air pollution have a strong impact in health, have a strong impact also in the absenteeism of workers when they must go to work in different cities of the world is very complicated. It's a very, very big challenge to, uh, to, 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 to provide the necessary tools to avoid that those workers, they are sick, they cannot work, and that have an impact on the companies and their competitiveness. At the same time, we are seeing that uh, the, the standards, the indicators, the voluntary plans are not working, are not working. We need more binding instruments. We need more, uh, the commitments uh, uh, are real. We need that the commitments of the countries are real. And for that reason, we think that this Talanoa dialogue continues to have a role to play, not only in Europe, but also outside, because there is the perception that for several countries, including workers, this just transition is like a rich country's caprice, no? It's like the ones that have developed at the time that uh, was permitted, now they want us to restrict. They want to us to go uh, slow. And for that reason, we as the trade unions, we are uh, doing a strong work of uh, training our members, uh, explaining the impact of these uh, behaviors. And also we are trying to convince them that they are players in each work center, they can play a role. Means it's not only to go to the big structures, it's you are a worker in your sector, in the, agricultu in the agricultural sector, in the industry, in the construction sector, you can play a role. Businesses are crucial partners to secure uh, a low-carbon economy, and as you may be aware, uh, corporate sustainability is already incorporated in the core business strategy of many companies, and many others are uh, ready to align. Okay, let's face it, the task is huge. Um, there are many complex issues to solve, and still we all converge uh, on the need to take urgent actions and to deliver. So more is to be done and the pace of uh, uh, change must be accelerated. However, the private sector um, as a solution provider faces increasing uncertainty about the implementation of environmental policies. And furthermore, uh, developing technology to decarbonize remains a challenge in several industries. Also, Implementation of new technologies are often not yet cost-effective or even possible. Therefore, to tackle the challenges require more than ever cooperation between all stakeholders and maybe more reality checks. If we focus for on productivity, so what this shows is what is the impact of uh, 
of, a, of an increase in the stringency of environmental policies on the productivity uh, at, at the industry levels and at the firm level. So on the left-hand panel, what we see is the impact at the industry level. And the first thing to note is that when we look at industry, is that there's none of these uh, red, uh, red, red points that are below zero. So overall, the, the impact has been found to be positive in general. Now, not hugely positive, but positive nonetheless. What we see when we split industries according to their level of productivity and pollution intensity, now we start to see some difference. And the industries that have benefited the most are the ones that are most productive, that is closest to the technological frontier, but at the same time, uh, most heavily polluting. So the high degree of pollution exposes them more directly to the stringency of the policy, but at the same time, they have the cap being most productive, they have the capabilities to adapt, adjust, and what we see here is this capability dominating the fact that they're facing, they're more exposed, and there tends to be industries that have benefited. It is true that we are used to set targets in the future and align many sectors in the same goal. No? But uh, in fact, I have this dilemma always because we, we are always using metrics to do this no? and say, well, in, in five years, why not in five years? No? No, in, in 10 years, why don't we uh, reach this goal in 10 years? But the planet has not 10 fingers to measure <laughs> the impacts that we are causing them. <coughs> so, um, Alan, please, according to your experience, uh, what are the best strategy to convince finance ministries to support green growth policies? Um, yes. So I think uh, doing precisely what we've been doing is certainly part of the strategy, providing them with as much uh, evidence as possible, and uh, uh, both in terms of overall impact, but also in terms of understanding the channels via which some of the environmental policies and green growth policies will have an impact on the economy. So to help them establish policy strategies to cope with with uh, with these impacts. So that certainly is one key aspect. And emphasizing here again the fact that the need to take into account there will be winners and losers, and with as as much as possible, uh, as good as possible, an, identifica an identification, an idea of who, who might be the winners and who might be the losers, and of course that is not easy because it depends on the different dimensions, different policies, uh, is also is certainly a key to, uh, to, to help uh, persuade finance ministers that you can achieve these uh, environmental goals without harming the economy uh, beyond uh, the natural sort of churning or transition that we're facing anyway f uh, uh, due to other other trends. Now, it might be tempting also to persuade them uh, by saying these are finance ministers, after all, uh, to say that this could also at the same time be a good source of revenues, uh, environmental policy mm -hmm. might, but that would be, of course, a mistake, and we see in, indeed the impact here. And I think this was mentioned, the example that Professor Stearns mentioned about British Columbia, the idea, because, one thing that is, of course, needed uh, in terms of a good strategy is to make sure that is, of course, overcome the, the big political economy barriers. 